Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Paranormal Pets. I'm your host, Brandy Stark, and I am here in chilly, chilly St. Petersburg on Christmas night. But what a perfect time to tell tales of werewolves, particularly those associated with Christian saints. And at the end of this episode, we have a guest appearance by Marina, who is a Spirits of St. Petersburg member, who will talk about her paranormal puppy. So we'll get started with all of that right after these messages. Pets are part of the family. Make sure you can always afford the quality health care they need with Easy Pet Check, a nationwide pet insurance alternative. With Easy Pet Check, you'll save up to 75% on all your pet's health care at any licensed veterinarian in the U.S. Easy Pet Check accepts all dogs and cats regardless of pre-existing conditions. Visit EasyPetCheck.com. That's the letters EasyPetCheck.com. Taking care of your pet can be easy with Easy Pet Check. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. And welcome back to Paranormal Pets. All is quiet. So essentially you will probably hear a few pugs snoring in the background, but... A lot of people do not realize that the Christmas holiday was actually a time for ghost stories. And there have been a few decent articles that have come out talking about this. And of course, A Christmas Carol has the best known ghosts with Marley showing up and then literally the spirits of Christmas past, present, and future. So the idea of the solstice creating the shortest day and the longest night, plus, of course, the hope of the holiday with light being born to overcome dark, did produce some great ghost stories for the time. But for us, we are taking a look, not at ghosts, but at werewolves, which are probably just about as much fun. The Spirits of St. Petersburg has a charter library, a little free library of supernatural stuff that is located outside of Art Lofts, where my studio is, 10th Street North in St. Petersburg. So if you're ever out and about in this area, please feel free to stop by and check it out. But we had a couple of books donated on werewolves. So as the librarian for this particular set, it behooves me to grab such wonderful materials, read them, and utilize what I can for this podcast, and then I will release them back to the Little Free Library world. So these will eventually be up for grabs for borrowing and sharing. But this one is a field guide to shapeshifters, lycanthropes, and man beasts, and it's called Werewolves by Dr. Bob Curran, who is the author of Vampires. I love this topic because I have done research and I've talked on werewolves myself, particularly dealing with the evolution of wolves in stories. And of course, we've taught the Brothers Grimm Little Red Cap story, which uh, some people actually believe is a coming of age story. The red cape representing menstruation, the young woman on the path to visit her grandmother. However, if you do not know, the original story was actually pretty grim. Little Red Riding Hood was a very young child. There's a lot of wolf symbolism in medieval art. They kind of represent lechery of sorts. And ultimately, the original French story, Little Red Riding Hood doesn't make it, nor does her grandma. The the wolf actually eats them both, and that's the end. It's the Germans who bring in our wonderful axe-bearing man who chops open the wolf, lets out Grandma and Red Riding Hood, they are able to stitch up the wolf's stomach full of stones and he can't run away. Basically, he dies from the weight of the stones, which is also actually pretty grim. But uh, you are more than welcome. You can actually find Little Red Cap out there. Uh, free to read on the internet. But what an interesting story, right, to talk about. I think it is Grandma who comes up with the rock idea, of course, representing her wiliness and her wisdom as an older woman. But 
What do we do with Christian saints who turn out to be linked with wolf images and wolf heads? Now, this is something interesting and something I've oftentimes wondered because I've run across this a couple of times with a few stories like that of Gerald of Wales that has a werewolf who finds a priest to give his dying werewolf wife, I'll try to say that, his dying werewolf wife, last rights. Ooh, boy, that's a a mouthful. Luckily, I had cake tonight, so I've got some sugar going through this blood. But uh, the author starts off with the idea that Christianity actually adopts the imagery of the wolf in some of its legend. Several saints were depicted with having either wolf's heads or exhibiting wolf-like characteristics, which become the stuff of Christian fable. The saints sometimes change from men into hounds and vice versa. One such story concerned the 13th century story of the French saint, okay, now if you speak French, I'm sorry, Guinefort who was linked to an early holy man. According to tradition, it was said that the saint had been born as a greyhound, which was the pet of a wealthy nobleman. This lord had a young infant son, whom the dog was supposed to guard against harm. One day after returning from a hunting trip, the noble found the infant's crib and the infant covered with blood. There was also blood around his supposedly faithful hound. To all appearances, the hound had attacked and killed the child. In anger and despair, the noble attacked the hound and killed it. Only then did he see that the infant was not dead and that below the crib lay a large and very dead snake linked in Christian mythology to Satan himself. Rather than attacking the infant, the faithful hound had protected the crib and slain the creature that had tried to attack it. The nobleman was beside himself with grief and remorse. He buried the hound in a holy well around which he planted a grove of trees as it was an ancient Celtic custom. Local people hearing of the innocent dog's heroic act made pilgrimages to the place and left stones there to form a shrine. Gradually, the fame of Guinea Fort grew and spread to some other places in France. Eventually, a text called Concerning the Dog Guinea Fort began to circulate, and the story is mentioned by the medieval writer Simone of Bourbon. A cult grew around the buried dog that rivaled any saint, naming the hound as the holy protector of small children. Indeed, there was a clamor for the creature to be fully made a saint. This is where the church stepped in. It is forbidden under canon law to accord any animal saintly status, although it can be declared a heretic. Nevertheless, a compromise was reached. The name Guinefort was attached to a, another saint, and the church declared that the holy dog had actually been changed into a man. God had decreed had the power to grant a soul to an animal if it showed goodness and heroism, thus changing it into a human form. But it warned he conversely also had the power to change men into beasts if they showed sinful or lewd behavior. Thus, Guinefort became known across medieval France as the dog saint, a holy man who was linked to a canine. The adverse of this was, of course, a werewolf, the man who changed into a canine. A nearly identical story to that of Guinefort comes from Wales, where Saint Gerlert was once said to be the favorite hound of, oh boy, Llewellyn the Great, a ruler of Gwynedd. He, too, was changed into a man. A slightly similar story is also associated with St. Roche of Montpellier, who was served by a faithful and holy dog who stole bread from its master's table to take to the saint when he lay as a plague victim in the forest. In some stories, the animal was rewarded for this holy act by a gift of a soul, thus changing it into a man similar to St. Guinefort. From then on, the dogman drops from history and from legend. Which I kind of find a little bit sad because, quite frankly, these are the kind of pets we really need, you know? And ultimately, it does kind of show this nice connection, this realization, perhaps much earlier than the 20th century, of the loyalty and the abilities of animals. The negative side of this, of course, is that animals don't have souls until God grants them, but at least a few of them apparently made it. Now, this I've, I found fascinating. I don't know how many of you out there had St. Christopher's medallions. I believe that the church has kind of stepped back from the St. Christopher phenomenon. He was the patron saint of travel, but he shows up here in this book on werewolves. So anyway, these were not the only holy men who have strong canine connections. The most famous was, of course, St. Christopher, the patron saint of travelers, who, 
in certain medieval depictions of him bore a dog's head, kind of like, I guess, Anubis. And in some ways, this would make some sense, because if Christopher is the patron saint of travel, and his story comes that he helped carry the Christ child across the river, Anubis was what we call a psychopomp. He was the jackal-headed psychopomp, the god who led the soul of the dead to the underworld. Christopher, in taking Christ across the river, would also be a liminal character in the sense that rivers oftentimes represent death. You go from one shore to the other. So I don't know if there's a connection there, and I don't think this book talks about it, but symbolically, you know, that could be a nice little paper. We'll see. Okay. Anyway, so according to the story, the name Christopher is usually mean to taken to mean Christ bearer, but this version is a Greek variation of a baptismal name that was given to him. In Latin, his original name is Reprobus, which is a corruption of the name Reprobus, meaning wicked. According to ancient tradition, Christopher was one of the dog-headed race whose name is sometimes given as the Maramatai, supposedly from an obscure country known as Marmesia, somewhere in North Africa. It was also said that early in his life, Christopher was an eater of human flesh and spoke only in the harsh and guttural language of the dog-headed race. On hearing the words of a Christian prophet who preached on the borders of his country, Christopher began to meditate upon his condition, upon his practice. As he did so, an angel appeared and touched his mouth so that he could speak in languages that all men would understand. At this, Christopher left his own country and traveled into the Greek world, where he began to proclaim the Christian gospel to all who would listen, becoming a forceful missionary in a number of lands. This, according to some traditions, is what his name really meant, for he bore the word of Christ into many pagan lands. However, he still remained a dog-headed figure, and the church was still highly suspicious of him, which is interesting. Again, I think he got decanonized. I'll have to look. Let's see. The story of Christopher as a dog had persisted long into the medieval period, especially in Ireland, where the monks of the Celtic church still used Greek script. The story of Christopher was widely written in Greek rather than Latin and relayed the story among the many monasteries of the island. The venerable Ledbar Brock, the speckled book, contains an 8th century Irish calendar of saints explicitly stating that Christopher was a member of the dog-headed race. He ate human flesh, and as he meditated on God, he could only speak in the language of the dog heads. A contemporary English writer, Walter of Bayer also gives two biographies of the saint, one in prose and one in verse, which also allude to the fact that Christopher had a dog's head and that he came from a race of similar creatures. The story may originate from the reign of Roman Emperor Diocletian. During this time, it is said that certain warriors named Reprobus, scoundrel, were captured in battle and brought to Rome as a prisoner. He was uh, said to be bigger than any ordinary human, more muscular, and he had the head of a dog. He came from Marmarica, there we go, which was either in North Africa or somewhere further east, and was said to have a broad, prestigious strength. The story may have generated around a Berber warrior from the Atlas Mountain of modern-day Morocco who, although not having the head of a dog, was constantly and certainly more than average in stature and a fierce fighter, a questionable attribute of this man. Basically, the church kind of took his legend and transformed him into a saint. Christopher, of course, is always considered something of a problem, because he has such strong pagan connections. In other versions of the tale, he is fully human, but a giant, a member of an ancient race that once walked the earth. It is in this guise that he bears the Christ child upon his shoulders across the raging torrent. In some instances, he was not really considered to be a saint, and thus equal to the other fathers of the church. Although his name had existed since the English Middle Ages, some even questioned if he had existed at all. Laterally, his name was struck off the list of official saints, so there's my answer. Though he had, and he is, or he still may be, venerated in some quarters, but he is not officially recognized by the Vatican. 
So I always thought that was kind of cool because Christopher was such a popular saint. And yet here I never knew of his connection to the dog headed element. So there you go. If you, uh, if you have your St. Christopher medallion and you happen to see any doggish characteristics, you now know why. And we'll continue on with this line of thought right after a few more messages. We'll be right back. Time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. Paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There's no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Radio.com, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information, on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host, Brandy Stark. And welcome back. We're going to try to finish up our little section on some of the Christian saints that are associated with the dog-headed images from the Middle Ages. So again, kind of a, a very unusual twist. But... We talked about Christopher, but it turns out there is an Eastern holy man, St. Andrew of Kokar Khaleesi, part of modern-day Turkey. Nothing is known about this saint, and it's possible that such a character results from an early Christian legend concerning St. Andrew and St. Bartholomew. In this tale, the two saints ventured among the Parthenians, an influential people living in the central plateau of modern-day Iran. They found their cities abominable and the people practicing cannibalism. It is said that some of the high magistrates of the settlements boasted the heads of dogs, though this may have been more of a generalized term of abuse, and that Andrew in particular preached against them. It is possible that the story got confused with the reference to a Turkish saint attributing the dog head to him. And I do find this interesting because, again, in prior episodes of Paranormal Pets, we do talk about how canines are associated with death and the barrier between worlds. Oftentimes, they are associated as such because they have such wonderful noses and will find the dead and consume it. And, of course, symbolically, you are what you eat, and therefore, they become associated with death. And, of course, if you are not aware... There are times when canines will scavenge over the dead bodies of other canines, so you do end up with that cannibalism that uh, humanity finds rather reprehensible. So kind of an interesting mix here. So let's see. Well, they do talk a little bit about a dog-headed race, so maybe we'll add this story in and pause here, and then we will introduce uh, Marina to you all so that she can tell her story. The idea of dog-headed saints, of course, also opens up the question of races of dog-headed people living somewhere in the world. So I guess that would make sense, sure. As explorers traveled further and further across the medieval world, they returned with tales of great wonders and strange people to be found in foreign lands. They spoke of men with large eyes in the center of their stomachs, of races with impossibly long ears, of beings who hopped only on one foot. Every story, a possible exaggeration, a misinterpretation, or a flight of imagination and hyperbole. One of the oldest of these legendary races were the dog heads who had appeared in fables and stories since the earliest time. The belief in the dog-headed race was incredibly widespread, especially in Western Europe. After all, as we noted previously, St. Christopher was supposed to have come from this race. However, and I do find this interesting, the, the chapter goes on to say, 
the race of dog-headed people is initially associated with North Africa, but that kind of continues to move further and further kind of away, that the more people explored, the less they found this to be actually true, and so the more abstracted the story becomes. Okay, so as we continue on, some of these races of dog heads were alleged to dwell on remote islands. This is cool because what I found with this is that I've also done research on Amazons and it's the same phenomenon. So the ancient Greeks, I mean, they're quite serious. They talk about Amazon warriors. The Amazons fought in Troy. Achilles kind of might have had, well, anyway, y'all can read that chapter yourselves. There's some questionable behavior from Achilles with one of the bodies of the Amazons. But what is interesting is that the Greeks, as they explored more and more of the world, always put the Amazons kind of on the edge of civilization. Because sadly, the Greeks thought such a race of people, of women warriors, was so backwards that they kind of had to be out in the boondocks. So I do find it rather interesting that not only do we have this phenomenon with the Amazons, but we also have it with the dog heads. According to the ancient cultures, the idea of the dog-headed races, they were monstrous and primitive, and they spoke in a barking voice. And some believe that the word barbarian is taken from the Greek mockery of such a tongue, which was considered the tongue of a foreigner. Now, I had heard that barbar was associated for barbarians with the sound of sheep. This author says barbar is similar to the childish bow wow, representing uh, the barking of a dog. If such beings did exist, the question was then asked as to what manner of creature were they? Were they men or beasts? Did they have souls or not? Could they attain salvation through Christ, as did other men? The great thinkers and churchmen of the time hotly debated this issue. Some learned men argued that if the dog heads existed, they were simply another branch of mankind. Others, however, argued that there were no more than ravening beasts and pointed to their alleged cannibalism and supposed ferocious behavior. Foremost in the denunciation of the dog-headed race was the church, which declared them as little more than brute beasts. They would not enjoy Christ's salvation. The prelates declared because they were not true men, had no souls, and were completely given over to animal lusts. So the church actually did take this quite seriously, which I find absolutely intriguing. Well, we are going to pause here on our Werewolves of Winter discussion, lecture, talk, whatever it is I'm doing here, and we are going to hear from Marina. So let's see what she has to say. So tonight I have with me Marina, who is one of the members of the Spirits of St. Petersburg, and she was telling me that she had a paranormal pet story, so I asked her to come on and tell us a little bit about it. So Marina, what happened to you and your paranormal pet? Well, it's actually couple of things. I used to live in a townhouse down near McDowell Air Force Base, and it was a brand new build, but the land used to be a mobile home park. And so one of the things was upstairs in the master bedroom, the dog would just stare into this one particular corner and would do this low guttural growl, and then sometimes refuse to walk into the room by herself. Like, unless I came in, she wouldn't. She would just stand there at the threshold and just wouldn't go in. So that was upstairs. And then one time downstairs, I was laying on the sofa watching TV, and she was laying on top of me, her face facing me. And all of a sudden, she picked up her head and looked behind me, or past me, and then her head just started moving as if she were following someone walking right by the sofa. Oh, wow. And... There was no one there. It was just me and her. So it was um, interesting. (laughs) Now, is this the little dog that you still have now? Yes. Yeah, she's 11 now. This probably happened, oh, geez, probably about eight years ago, maybe. Oh, she was a youngster. Yeah. All right. Yeah, she was a little pup. (laughs) And has she done it since? No, just really that house. Yeah, just that house. It was upstairs in the main bedroom, the master bedroom. And then downstairs that one time on the sofa. Okay. And uh, what did you make of it? I mean, did anything ever happen there? Well, actually, I did have a weird experience upstairs in the bedroom. I had gotten out of the shower once, and the ceiling fan 
was slowly rotating, but the switch was off. And you were totally alone. And I was totally alone. The switch was off. It wasn't the air conditioning because it would have done it more often. That was the only time it ever did it. And like the house I'm in now, the ceiling fan is in direct line of the AC vent. And it never moves oh, unless wow. it's physically on. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there was probably stuff that happened at the mobile home park. And it was just residual stuff that she was picking up on, I hope. <laughs> Very cool. Well, if anything else happens with her, be sure to let us know. Does that sound all right? Will do. All right. Well, thank you so much for your paranormal pet story. All right, then. I want to thank everybody for tuning in for this episode and for Marina for coming on to talk. Uh, We're actually going to hear from her again. Uh, We had a little paranormal, was it paranormal or was it just normal in a paranormal setting? (laughs) Something happened with some animals on a paranormal investigation that we were doing. Nobody was hurt, so don't worry about that. But it was... It was actually quite funny in many ways. So we're actually going to have a little segment on that for next episode. I am going to continue to remind you, particularly as we have our pandemic and there are still animals in need of homes, please check your shelters. I'm always very pleased and surprised at the diversity of animals that are available. Do you remember that I just adopted a new bearded dragon, a little boy named Falcon, for $25 from the SPCA here in Largo, Florida. And I also adopted two rat brothers, essentially, Orca and Drame. They actually have potbelly pigs. They have ducks. I think they even had a couple goats. They have an entire iguana cage. They do take in a number of animals and maintain them for adoption. And uh, I do encourage you to, to keep an eye on those types of pages and bring home somebody who's in need of a home. They are very loving little creatures. And in fact, I currently have both Pumpkin and Falcon, both of my bearded dragons, are currently asleep on my windowsill, bundled up in a little uh, bearded dragon blanket to keep the chill off. But they're just great pets. I was very lucky to get both Falcon and the Rat Boys, who had been well handled and were in excellent health. So definitely check your shelters, support local, Keep on ghost hunting, and I will check with y'all next episode. If you'd like to see what the Spirits of St. Petersburg are doing, just go to www.spiritsofstpete.com. All right, y'all take care. Pet Life Radio presents Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Step into the supernatural world of pets every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.